I'm Blake Leith. Welcome to the Gratitude Series, Episode 7, the second in a three-episode series wherein I thank those whose examples, whose way of living, and ultimately dying, reveal to me, to all of us, what it is to be patient, to persevere, and to be personally disciplined, self-disciplined. I view these demonstrations as nesting together logically, like Russian dolls, if not altogether inseparably. And so we're exploring them that way in this three-episode run. Last time, we honored Anne Frank. Today, we study our bookworm, Viktor Frankl. And I'll explain at the end why I'm so thankful for his example of perseverance. Here are some of the broader strokes of his life. Viktor Frankl was born in Vienna in 1905 and, between 1928 and 1930, at 23 to 25 years of age and still a medical student, he organized youth counseling centers to tackle head-on the typical spike of teen suicides that occurred around end-of-year report cards. Sponsored by the city of Vienna and free of charge to students, Frankel and those he recruited brought the suicide rate to zero in 1931. After earning his MD in 1930, Frankel joined Steinhoff Psychiatric Hospital, where he was responsible for the treatment of suicidal women. He estimated that in those six years, he treated approximately 12,000 suicidal patients, his findings becoming the deep well from which he would draw wisdom six years later. By the time he and his wife Tilly were deported to their first concentration camp, Victor's focus had already become twofold. First, he helped numerous patients avoid the Nazi euthanasia program that targeted the mentally disabled. And second, he refined his approach to suicide prevention. You'll recall from the timeline presented in Episode 6, that Nazis aborted Tilly's and Victor's first and only child together, and that barely nine months after they were married, Frankel, his wife, and their families were sent to the first concentration camp. Victor's father died there from starvation and pneumonia. In 1944, Frankel and surviving members of his family were transported to Auschwitz, where his mother and brother were murdered in the gas chambers. Tilly died later of typhus in Bergen-Belsen, as had Anne Frank. All told, Victor spent three years in four concentration camps before being liberated by Allied forces, also known as the Allies, Allied Nations, and today's United Nations. Following the war, Victor became head of the neurology department at Vienna Polyclinic Hospital, established a private practice in his home, and regularly served patients one-on-one for 25 years. During that time, he earned his Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Vienna and explored the intersections of psychology, faith, and self-discovery. In his long and fruitful career, as abundant and prolific as one can imagine, Victor served as a professor of neurology and psychiatry at the University of Vienna, and also as a visiting professor and lecturer at Harvard University, Southern Methodist University, and Duquesne University. In terms of legacy, Dr. Frankel is best known for his 1946 book originally titled A Psychologist Experiences the Concentration Camp, though I prefer the book as titled in subsequent German editions because it clarifies its contents so much more effectively. Nevertheless, say yes to life. Nevertheless, indeed. The first English edition, published in 1959, was given the abominable title From Death Camp to Existentialism, then eventually to what we know it as today, Man's Search for Meaning. The book is two halves of a whole, the first half speaking to the horrors of camp existence, and the second half introducing what Frankel described as logotherapy, 
logo from the Greek logos, or meaning. Its central thesis being that striving to find meaning in life is the fundamental, primary, most powerful, motivating, and driving force in human beings. As such, Frankel's work joined what came to be known as the Third Viennese School of Psychotherapy, along with Freud's psychoanalysis and Adler's individual psychology. What elevates Frankel's work, however, and sets it apart from those considered his contemporaries, is his belief that neither pleasure nor power, our basis of instincts, can approach the force that is meaning, or, more specifically, the pursuing of it. In this sense, his work is beyond Locke and Jefferson and plucks at the mystic chords Abraham Lincoln described some 85 years prior when he delivered his first inaugural address and appealed to the better angels of our nature. Though Frankel eventually published a total of 39 books, Man's Search for Meaning, far and away his simplest, his most basic, his most accessible, his rawest, his most personal, and the one he dictated in just nine blistering days, remains his greatest and is also regarded as the classic tribute to hope from the Holocaust. In 1985, the American Psychiatric Association, along with the Association of Mental Health Clergy, now the Association of Professional Chaplains, awarded Frankel the Oscar Pfister Award for his contributions to religion and psychiatry. In 1991, a survey conducted by the Library of Congress and the Book of the Month Club named Man's Search for Meaning one of the ten most influential books in the United States. By 2022, Man's Search for Meaning had been translated into 25 languages, and 16 million copies had been sold around the world. Before his death in 1997, Victor was asked about his little book's success. What drove it? and he offered two explanatory reasons. The first being its subject matter, meaning, and whether one views his or her life as meaning less or meaning full, and if the former, how to nurture the latter. And second, the book's universality, indicating that meaninglessness, or one's perception of it, or experience with it, albeit personal, is actually pervasive around the world. Meaninglessness, as he put it, being the mass neurosis of modern times. Here's a distillation of Frankel's nine key findings, or central tenets, of logotherapy, including three principles. And remember, these are from a man who, having lost his wife, unborn child, father, mother, and brother, under the fanatical reign of Nazism, never lost his own humanity, his compassion, loyalty, and zest for life. Victor continued to learn, to evolve, to plow ahead, to move forward, to progress. He earned his pilot's license at age 67 and researched, educated, and counseled others in one way or another voraciously for the 52 years between his 1945 liberation and subsequent discovery that very nearly everyone important to him in his prior life had already died. And the only occurrence that slowed his life down was death itself at age 92 in 97. First was his belief that both psychiatry and psychology had been dehumanized, focusing on bodies, diseases, and mechanisms. And Frankel endeavored to rehumanize those fields, to focus on the person behind the maladies. In doing so, he gracefully integrated ideas from religion, science, and philosophy. Number two. Logotherapy maintains that a human's principal motivation is not to search for power, supremacy, 
or pleasure, gratification or enjoyment, but rather to discover the purpose of existence. The primary motivational force in life, therefore, is to find meaning, a purpose in life to feel positive about, and then immersively imagining and pursuing that outcome. According to Frankel, the way a prisoner imagined the future, or did not, affected his or her longevity. Those who held to a future were likeliest to survive, and those who disbelieved became apathetic, withdrawn, and commonly died alone in their barracks or at the fence, or by their own hand, be it neglect, failure to thrive, or death by suicide. Number three, despite being reduced to a number, 119104, a skeleton, and a prisoner in four concentration camps across three years, Frankel discovered a sense-making raison d'etre, reason for being, in all his sufferings, a pursuit that enabled him to say yes to life in spite of everything. The one thing, Victor reasoned, that he would never allow Nazis to steal from him would be his freedom to choose his attitude amidst the worst conditions and the greatest atrocities in the annals of human history generally and in terms of war crimes specifically. Number four. Frankel stressed that people should not suffer unnecessarily in order to find meaning but that meaning was possible when suffering is inevitable. For example, a person subjected to an incurable disease or placed in a concentration camp can still discover meaning even though his or her situation seems dire. Moreover, his idea of tragic optimism means that people are nevertheless capable of optimism in spite of the tragic triad. Frankel believed that all humans will be subjected to the tragic triad, which consists of guilt, death, and unavoidable suffering. These things are part and parcel of the human condition, and rather than being avoided, they are instead to be reconciled, to be integrated in manageable rather than overwhelming ways. Number five, his predecessor's concepts had revolved around depth psychology and focused on insights from the natural and unconscious processes within a person, whereas Frankel's work revolved around height psychology and promoted the idea that people could transcend their physical urges and external state. Unlike psychotherapy, which had been retrospective and introspective, logotherapy focuses on the future aspects of a patient's life. Most specifically, the meaning that one intends to fulfill, the pursuit and finding of purpose in one's life or tasks. At the time, this was a radical psychiatric psychological departure because many were actively engaged in pursuing happiness, whereas Frankel suggested that if we live on purpose, happiness will ensue. Joy, he argued, does not precede purpose, but rather succeeds it. Said another way, to the extent one lives on purpose, fulfillment is likelier to follow. Number six. Frankel's logotherapy is comprised of three basic principles. The first principle is that life has meaning in all circumstances, even despondent ones. The second principle is that the main motivational force is the desire to find meaning in life. And the third basic principle states that humanity has the freedom of attitudinal choice, even in situations of unchangeable affliction. Thus, Frankel purported that people can discover meaning through creative, experiential, and attitudinal values of their choosing. 
Creative values consist of the achievement of tasks such as painting a picture, tending a flower bed, or even cleaning the garage or keeping a home. Experiential values consist of encountering another human being, such as a loved one, or by experiencing the world through a state of receptivity, such as appreciating natural beauty, savoring a fine meal with friends, or joining in a game of virtually any kind. Attitudinal values speak to the potential to make meaningful choices in situations of suffering and adversity, which will become evident when we explore Terry Fox's choices in Episode 8. Number 7. A person's will to meaning can become frustrated. Frankel coined the term existential frustration to explain this phenomenon of misdirected meaning. Existential frustration can occur from prolonged periods of boredom and apathy, not unlike those that many described experiencing during our recent pandemic. Frankel utilized the metaphor of an existential vacuum to explain frustrated meaning. Meaninglessness is a hole, he said, which creates a vacuum that must be filled. Since it is a vacuum, people quickly try to fill that void of meaninglessness. However, most attempts to fill this sense of emptiness are merely temporary, as the whole is filled, generally, with superficial things. Furthermore, Frankel believed that common maladaptive behaviors, such as aggression, depression, and addiction, are caused by a misdirected sense of meaning. He noted that every generation has its own set of maladaptive behaviors, which he coined as the collective neurosis. I personally can't help but think of social media and phone time here, and the loneliness epidemic we explored together in episode two's Bad News. Number eight. Frankel stressed that a person's concerns and anguish over the meaninglessness of life are an existential distress, not necessarily mental disease, and that this inner existential tension regarding meaning is normal, is in fact the norm, and that reconciling such tension is the aim for each of us every day versus, say, achieving inner equilibrium. This is a huge idea, so don't miss it. To learn more about existential tension, Check out Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z, on Netflix, because Jonah Hill's therapist, Dr. Phil Stutz, employs a number of Frankel's best tools, not the least of which is coming to terms with the constancy of internal tension and disequilibrium. And finally, number nine, in the 75 years since its creation, the effectiveness of logotherapy has been demonstrated in children experiencing existential distress, in adolescents and young adults facing terminal cancer, in those battling alcoholism, post-traumatic stress disorder, in the lives of nurses and doctors who deal daily in matters of life, death, and loss, and in those struggling to resist suicidal ideation. More prosaically, Meaningfulness practices succeed regularly at helping families, leaders, managers, team members, employees, and individuals of every sort and stripe to improve their productivity, performance, fulfillment, and all the rest through creating optimism in their environments, often by defining the why behind one's purpose and then pursuing it so that joy ensues. If you look, you'll see this golden thread evident in many of today's best practices, as it forms the basis of countless contemporary derivatives. In conclusion, here are three of my favorite passages from Man's Search for Meaning. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walk through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, 
but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. To choose one's own way. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And last but not least, our generation is realistic, he wrote, for we have come to know man as he really is. After all, man is that being who invented the gas chambers at Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Yisrael on his lips. Thank you for pausing today to hear Victor's story. Please join me again next time for Episode 8, Personal Discipline, Self-Discipline, when, as promised, we'll meet Terry Fox, a young adult facing terminal cancer who takes a page straight out of man's search for meaning and animates everything Victor believed in. Our runner's physical feat shall serve as nothing less than a timeless testament to all that Victor held dear.